All right. I feel like Casey from Camera Conspiracies, but here I am out in the street with the Tamron 11 to 20 f2.8 at 11 mil at f2.8, kind of an arm's length away, so about maybe two and a half feet from the mount. And this is what it looks like with OIS, uh, not OIS, sorry, with IBIS on the X-T4. And of course, I can see myself on the X-T4. Hello everyone and welcome to BHC Studio. Today we will be taking a look at the brand new Tamron 11 to 20 f2.8 DI3ARXD lens for Fujifilm X mount. Now this lens itself is not brand new. This was previously available as E mount, like the 1770 f2.8 uh, that came out for Fujifilm X mount a while back, and I had a chance to review. I'll put the link down below. Beautiful lens, awesome, awesome optics. Worked great with Fujifilm. This is the lens that I had mentioned in that video. I hope. Tamron releases this lens for X mount and now they have and before we do the unboxing I thought I would actually just show you a legacy Tamron lens. This is quite a famous lens actually a, a 22 40 millimeter f 2.7 f 3.5 uh, for Minolta, but they made this in Canon and Nikon Pentax mount as well Beautiful lens uh, back in the day. I must have bought this in the late 90s It's part focal so you can set the focal distance here and as you zoom as you notice the focus distance does not change a lot of the old SLR lenses and some modern DSLR lenses are par focal, so this would be great for video and such. That's not as common today, but I still have this full frame lens. I use it on my Minolta system or the Sony A mount system, and I've been a huge fan of Tamron, and so let's uh, unbox this uh, lens right now. Actually, just one more thing too. Uh, this is a lens that probably most people will be comparing uh, this lens here to is the Fujifilm's own 10 to 24. This is the older version. The doesn't have the uh, the marked aperture ring. Doesn't have the A mode. It has an A kind of a switch here. The switches are gone, and the new version is also WR. So that's kind of what I'll be comparing it to. Uh, this lens here, not this one here. But there is a reason why I think some may want the older version. So let's uh, start the unboxing here. Tamron's box packaging is pretty plain and like I kind of complained about the Samyang I don't like this glossy cardboard box. It doesn't affect anything I do like matte cardboard boxes, but very small complaint and we have some paperwork here uh, Instructions. Oh, it's kind of pink color. That's awesome. And anyways, we will I don't think most people look through this thing here and like more and more brands are using less styrofoam and using more cardboard which is nice to see easier to recycle these things here and that's it let's move this aside and let's open this up so i haven't even looked at this i have no idea i mean it's going to look exactly the same as the sony version but here you go look at this it does definitely remind me a lot of the 17 to 70. It's mostly or almost all plastic, but it's a, you know, it's a polycarbonate, right? So I mean, you say plastic, it's not the same as a plastic bag. There's different types of plastic, but look at this. And this is uh, Fujifilm's own version here. So almost the same size, if you look at it, almost the same. Let's just take the um, lens caps off here. Here you go, so here's the lens caps off. You know what, even let's take the rear caps off. That's probably going to be a better way of looking at it. Yeah, it's basically the same size. So the issue with previous, the Tamron 70-70 was that it was more beer can shaped and it was longer than Fujifilm's own 16 to 55 f2.8. But this is pretty much the same size here. Look at that. And so let's uh, clean up. All right, now it's a little bit tidier. We can take a look at these two lenses right here. Look at that. Now, definitely there's a weight difference. Fujifilm's 385 grams. Tamron is 335 grams, so about a 50 gram difference. You can feel the difference, but you have to remember this is there's more metal in this and there's more plastic in this. So obviously there's a reason why this is definitely heavier, but let's just put this down here and feel the zoom action here. 11 is actually telescoped out. And then as you go to 20, it actually pulls back in here. That's the design here. And here's a focus ring. And like most third-party lenses, there is no aperture ring. And it makes sense. Initially, this was designed for the Sony E-mount. But perhaps in the future, if there's a, a newer version, that they would actually have an aperture ring for us Fujifilm shooters. And so let's look, first of all, at the price here. We're talking about $829 US for the Tamron. 
which is their new price. The Sony version is currently on sale at b &H, but this is, you know, coming out brand new, Fujifilm mount, 829, reasonable price. This one here, the new version, not the older version, Fujifilm XF 10 to 24 is 999. So definitely cheaper, but oftentimes we do see a price difference between the OEM original manufacturer with a third party lens manufacturer. There's a much larger price difference, but of course there is a performance difference because this lens here from Tamron is an F 2.8 constant. And that is just amazing thinking about the size and weight of this compared to Fujifilm's F4 constant. So there's a one stop difference between these two lenses. Now there's partially another reason other than it being metal, this also does have built in optical image stabilization up to 3.5 stops. So if you have one of the prosumer cameras like the X-T30 or the X-E4, X-E3 that doesn't have any stabilization, it is nice to have this. You know, it's only 3.5 stops, but it's better than nothing. This lens here, does not have any stabilization. But 829, it's not cheap, but for what you're getting, 11 to 20 millimeter f2.8. So equivalency is about a 16.5 to 30 millimeter equivalent if you are shooting in full frame 35 millimeter. As well, this Fujifilm lens 10 to 24 is about a 15 to 36 mil equivalent. So you are getting closer to that standard focal length when you are shooting uh, with the Fujifilm. So you're getting a wider range, but one stop slower. And so let's think about the pros and cons. The pro for this lens is this is the closest lens that Fujifilm has. 10 to 24, one stop slower and yet more expensive. Fujifilm also has the 8 to 16 millimeter f2.8, but that lens is a chonker. That is 805 grams. So that is a, that's like 500 grams heavier than this lens. And it's the front filter element is so big that there is no filter thread in that, which kind of defeats the purpose. If you're going to be using this like a vlogging lens and you're putting a variable ND filter, you can't do that with the 8 to 16. And so uh, Fujifilm doesn't really have a competition to this lens. And even their primes, the 16 f1.4, not wide enough to be an ultra wide. The 14 millimeter f2.8, it's that clutch focus. It's an older, slower, noisier focusing design. Uh, and at 14 f2.8, you can go to right here. Look at that. You can get 14 millimeter f2.8 with this lens. Now, of course, Fujifilm's 14 f2.8 lens optically will probably be better than this lens here at 14 f2.8. But the point is you got the versatility of a zoom with this lens here. So that's the, the pro of this. Fujifilm has nothing equivalent and the closest equivalent is one stop slower and actually more expensive. Now, in terms of third party options, there is the, the Viltrox 13 millimeter f1.4 and I love this lens and like how I use this lens with Fujifilm's own XF 10 to 24 I didn't feel like I had to choose between these two if I wanted a fast ultra wide prime I use this if I needed the versatility of a zoom I use this and so likewise I actually think that if you get this lens here the 11 to 20 f 2.8 this lens here is two stops brighter and that's still a kind of a big deal. I mean, it's three stops brighter than this, but two stops brighter for this lens. So if you need a fast ultra wide prime lens, you have the Viltrox here. And if you just need the versatility of a zoom ultra wide, then you use this. And so I think these two actually complement each other quite well. And if you include Tamron's own 17 to 70 f 2.8, you're going from 11 to 70 2.8. Those are pretty much all the two lenses that you will need. Now, as mentioned, this is an f2.8, which is one of the big reasons why you would want to get this lens, because that's pretty fast for such a compact, ultra-wide zoom lens. But as well, this has a 15 centimeter minimum focus. So that's a one to four magnification. That's pretty darn good for an ultra-wide lens. And that is probably at the at 11 millimeter here. And at the wide end, it is 24 centimeters or 9.4 inches. But still, 5.9 inches minimum focus on an ultra wide lens. You can do some pretty cool stuff with this lens. 67 mil millimeter filter thread versus 72. So if you have some 67 mil filters, I think in fact the, the Viltrox is also, yeah, Viltrox also 70, 67. So you can share filters with this. So if you have a variable ND filter, you can go between these two lenses. Another reason why you would want both of these lenses here. And as I mentioned, finally, the price at $829, it's cheaper than the Fujifilm. Now, if you want to look at, I mean, I'm going to obviously do my own test, but because the Sony version has been out for over a year, you know, if you really want the optical performance, go check out all the other reviewers who have reviewed this lens on Sony. But the Tamron 70-70, 
was a stellar performer. And so I'm pretty sure that this lens will also perform very well. My Tamron 20 to 40, also a stunning performer. And so I'm pretty sure that this lens will do very well optically. And so let's just pop this on my X-T5 here. Now the X-T5 does have a small rig grip which extends the grip even further and you still have access to your battery. You have a couple of extra quarter 20s in the bottom. You have an extra slotted lug here if you wanted to put like a hand strap. But anyway, so this is what it looks like on the X-T5. What do you guys think? I think it looks pretty nice. Balance as well. Now in terms of cons, uh, let's go over it kind of quickly. This is not a true W, let me just see here. So there is, you could see there is a little bit of rubber gasket right here, which is nice. But Tamron themselves don't really call it weather sealed. What do they say? They call it moisture resistant construction. And so, you know, if you compare it to the Fujifilm, the new uh, WR version of this lens, you know, Fujifilm calls it WR. This lens here, I think it's just like light rain and a little bit of humidity, a little bit of dust, but you know, it's not fully WR. So it'd be nice to see a professional WR version of this lens. And as well, this lens does not have OIS, although in ultra wide lenses and f2.8, you could probably get away without having stabilization as long as it's not too slow. But if you need it, then your body will need to have its own IBIS. No aperture ring, which is kind of a make or break for some Fujifilm shooters. With a camera like the X-T5, you can program the front and rear so you can have the shutter speed, you can have this aperture and then switch it around if you want to. But if you have one of the Fujifilm bodies where there's only one front dial and you're, you are assigning these things to different things, maybe it's a bit of a pain, but that's another uh, con. And so maybe in the future, it'd be nice if some of these third-party manufacturers like Tamron and Sigma will give us an aperture ring just like Viltrox did with this lens here. That's awesome. Thank you, Viltrox. Um, this telescoping design is something I'm not that uh, excited about. Um, I understand why they do it, and that's probably why they can keep this compact, but especially when you're ultra wide like this. So this is when you wanna be the closest to the lens, then the, the lens is more telephoto. And so unlike Fujifilm's design here, it's fully internal zoom, so you can see it's zooming, there's a little bit of optical movement here. You can see it pulling back and then it pulls back out again, but it, it maintains this compact design. So at 10 millimeter, you can see here, now all of a sudden this lens is bigger, right? Because the front sticks out a little bit further. So that's a, that's a bit of a con. It's not a deal breaker. It doesn't stick out that far, but even still, uh, yeah, I would call this a con. Another con is that this is a mostly plastic design. Fujifilm, this front here is metal. This uh, focus ring is metal. This is a rubberized ring here. This aperture ring is metal. This chassis here is metal. Of course, the, the bayonet in here is the mount is also metal, but everything else is plastic. It doesn't feel like a cheap plastic, but that also probably helps to keep the weight down. But uh, I still prefer a mostly metal design lens. The Viltrox here as well is mostly all metal. You can probably tell by the shine on this. This thing here is mostly plastic, which plastic in itself doesn't make it bad. I mean, if you drop this lens, it more likely bounce than dent, but still, you know, it's nice to feel that cold feel of metal on here, and you're not gonna get that with this Tamron. So it does feel a little bit cheaper quality, but it doesn't mean the lens itself is not as good. And besides that, I mean, I think everything else is pretty much a, a pro with this lens here. And so who is this lens for? Well, this is lens for anyone that has this 10-24. to I mean, there's a lot of these out there. This actually is probably my favorite Fujifilm lens. I've taken this lens all over the world with me. I've used this for a, most of my vlogging videos. And also I love ultra wide street photography, which might seem weird, it's not easy to do but you could pull it off and this lens has all the right focal lengths as well as just standard street photography, right? When you zoom out the 24, you're getting a th almost like a 36 mil equivalent. So you can get to a sort of a standard wide angle with this lens as well. But the problem is the F4. A lot of people want a little bit brighter, a little bit more wide open aperture, both for shutter speed, but as well as for shallow depth of field. Now, when you are at 10 millimeter and you're at 11 millimeter here, it's not a big deal that it is f2.8, unless your subject is very close to you, and then you kind of get that weird effect, but you can kind of pull it off with this lens here, but having that 5.9 inch minimum focus at ultra wide angle is pretty darn cool. And so for $829, 
is it worth getting Fujifilm's $999 version of this, the new version of this? Again, it kind of comes down to what your priority is. You get a wider range with the XF10-24. to 24. So if you want to get away with one lens to do everything, you can get away with the 10-24. The to 24. This lens, it stops at 20, so it's about a 30 mil equivalent. You can't really get that 35 millimeter. So you're at 30 mil f2.8. You could probably still get a little bit of bokeh, but not a lot. So you'd have to switch over to, you know, Tamron's own 17 to 70 28 or Fujifilm's own 16 to 55 f2.8, or you jump into a prime. So this is not one lens to do everything. The, the range is more limited. So getting Fujifilm's version, the WR version, you are getting OIS and you are getting weather sealing, you are getting metal construction, but at one stop slower. Now another option is actually this lens, the older 10-24 to non-WR version of this lens. You could probably pick this lens up for $340 used. And a lot of people bought this lens and didn't really use it much. And so I've seen quite a few of these on the used market. So if you were considering the 10 to 24 WR from Fujifilm, but it's $1,000, you've probably already considered this lens for three, four $400, but you want something brighter. So I think for most people, it's kind of a no-brainer to get this Tamron here if you want that f2.8. So I'm going to be doing my testing here. Go to Fujilub. I haven't written an article yet. This is just my first, uh, my unboxing and first look. But I'm super excited to uh, put these two lenses up against each other. Another thing is I'm probably going to let uh, Chris meets Chris test this for vlogging. He was pretty excited about this. In fact, he said he would just buy this lens off of me from Tamron. Uh, this is, um, I don't know if this is a production or pre-production sample. But if this is a production sample, Tamron. Chris meets Chris wants it, so he wants to buy it. But I'm going to be doing vlogging tests uh, with this lens here. All right. I feel like Casey from Camera Conspiracies, but here I am out in the street with the Tamron 11 to 20 f2.8 at 11 mil at f2.8, kind of an arm's length away, so about maybe two and a half feet from the mount. And this is what it looks like with OIS, uh, not OIS, sorry, with IBIS on the X-T4 and of course I can see myself on the X-T4 and yeah this is what this lens looks like and as I mentioned at 11 mil it does stick out more it zooms out when you're at 11 millimeters so that's the one one of a few negatives I have with this Tamron so if I am in a restaurant and I want to get really close you're getting really close to the lens to the front but this is what this looks like at 2.8 and now I'm going to switch over to uh, Fujifilm's own XF10-24 you let me know if there's any kind of a huge a bokeh difference as I switch right so let's let's switch now alright so now we switch to the XF10-24 it's at 10 mil so you can tell it's a little bit wider and I feel like I can get closer because again the, this lens is more compact when you are vlogging but do you guys, do you see a, a bokeh difference? F4, F2.8 when you are about this close? Now if you turn it around like this and you shoot in the street, I don't think that one stop of difference will be a big deal, especially for vlogging or if you are, I mean, if you're doing landscape or something like that. But I think for vlogging, uh, you gain that extra stop when you are, what's the word I'm looking for? When it gets darker. All right, so now I'm gonna switch over to the Viltrox 13 millimeter f1.4, and I think there you'll see an immediate change or difference in the depth of field, right? So let's let's change over now. All right, I switch over to the Viltrox. I'm at f1.4. I had to change the shutter speed from 1 60th of a second to 1 3 20th. I didn't bring any uh, I didn't bring any ND filters with me, and so and I'm I was and I'm shooting at 30 frames per second. But, so it's a little bit jittery, but you can see the book, bookalicious difference, right? When you're shooting with the Filtrox. My arm is further out, but I still feel that with 13 millimeter, you can get away with this for vlogging. I think it's pretty darn sweet for vlogging, but you definitely need a variable ND filter when you're vlogging with this because it looks like I put an auto ISO in on the X-T4 and it's going to ISO 320. And so definitely if you want this kind of bokeh, but when you are inside, when it is dark inside your car, then having that f1.4, it's not just about the bokeh, but it's about being able to shoot wide open and getting enough light on that sensor. And so let's switch back to the Tamron uh, 11 to 20, and then we'll see again what the change in difference is, right? So let's do it now. All right, back to the Tamron, back to 11, you know, actually, 
this this is about this is about equivalent to what the Viltrox was, but you can see the bulk of difference, right? From f1.4 to f2.8, and now we went back to 1 60th of a second, the proper shutter speed for the frame rate, and this is what this lens looks like. But we can go to 11 here, a little bit more breathing room, a little bit more comfortable using this lens here. And so I'm going to start heading back to my studio. Let me know what you guys think when I am switching between the Viltrox 1314, the Tamron 11 f2.8, and then let's now switch back to Fujifilm's own 10 to 24 at f4. So let's do that now. Here we go. Now we're back with Fujifilm's 10 to 24 f4 at 10 mil f4. And again, I just feel like that breathing room, having a little bit wider 10 mil, a little bit closer to my face, definitely a little bit darker. I'm still fixed at, I'm at auto ISO, but at 1 60th of a second, 30 frames per second. And what's the auto ISO going to? Auto ISO, it's stuck at 320. So what do you guys think? I gotta do more testing on it, but for vlogging, I think the 11 to 20, 28, and this one is good, but in low light, I think the Tamron's gonna shine. And then if you want bokeh or even super low light, you wanna switch over to the Filtrox, all right? That's my first thoughts. All right, just for fun, I went back to the Filtrox 13 f 1.4 again, but I had to bump up the shutter speed to 1 3 20th of a second. I wish I brought my ND filters, but it is kind of fun to get this uh, tone when you vlog, isn't it? Let's just turn this way, because the sun is over this way, the lighting's a little bit better here. Took a side street, busier than I thought. Sun is out. It's actually 838, but the sun is still pretty bright here. But yeah, I mean, you know what? This lens is pretty sweet, but I'm sure when I'm out and about, and when you are vlogging, having a fixed focal length uh, vlogging lens limits you to a little bit what you can do. If you have a zoom lens, at least you can stop, turn around, zoom in, zoom back out. And that's where Fujifilm's 10 to 24 is nice. You can zoom from, you know, ultra wide angle to almost like standard wide, where even with the Tamron, you have the 2.8, but you're stuck at 20, which I think for most vloggers, is, that's more than enough, right? But again, having this Tone, I think having the Viltrox and having either the XF10-24 or the 11-20 is fine because having an f1.4 prime lens for vlogging for low light and tonalicious background is definitely worth it. All right, back to the studio. I'm kidding, I'm back again with the Tamron 11-20 at 11 mil at f2.8. But again, let me just, this is about where I was with the Viltrox. I'm, out, I'm about 13 mil. The marking is for a little bit more like this. So this is about what the Viltrox was but this is f2.8 on the Tamron. What do you guys think? Again, for vlogging, I still think it's better to go a bit wider. There you go, like that. And then as I mentioned, as you are vlogging, and you need to like, you see something over your shoulder, and you kind of zoom like that. What do you guys think? You can zoom like that, and then you can zoom back out on yourself again like this, and then you just keep on vlogging, right? And so, yeah, so having a zoom lens for vlogging, I think the compromise of having less range but having f2.8 will really start to show itself when you are in low light situations. When you're outside and you're vlogging, even with the 10 24, I often have to use a, an ND filter. But once you go indoors, definitely you start suffering at f4 and having that extra stop will be useful. But then again, f1.4 is even more useful. So. Anyway, sometimes the problem is you have too many lens choices. Better to just stick with one. If I had to just pick one for vlogging, I think the 11 to 20 would be great. But if it's for both vlogging and for shooting stills, I would pick the Fujifilm XF 10 and 24 and live with the F4. But then if you just need bokehlicious images, you need some tone, you get the Viltrox 1314. That's my final thoughts for now. But this is just my first look, my first impressions. Let me know down in the comments if you have any questions about this lens or if there's anything specific you want me to test. And as well, if you wanna know anything about this, um, this 10 to 24. All right, so thank you so much for watching. Tamron, thank you so much for sending this out to me. I'm gonna be testing this as soon as I can. Chris, I need your help on this one. All right, thanks for watching and happy shooting. Peace.